Yo, yo. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Future Cast on the Player Profiler Radio Network. I am Cody Carpenter. You can find me on Twitter at Carpenter NFL. We're back. It's Friday evening. It's 1.40. I'm 10 minutes late because I was just watching the Will Levis Pro Day. Yes, it was not the best, but that's all right because we saw the arm. We saw what he could do. We saw what he couldn't do, and there was one big takeaway that people should have noticed out of this is that he can make all these throws. Yes, he's a little erratic. He wanted to. We needed to see some accuracy throughout. We saw a little bit. We also saw some errant throws, um, some that didn't quite make sense. He just threw a ball uh, about 71 yards uh, projecting like if it would have landed. It landed like 68. The guy caught it, but it would have landed like 71. And he also had one that hit the ceiling at the Kentucky Pro Day uh, in the roof. So it's a good pro day. Definitely was not on par with the CJ Stroud, but that's okay. Um, Jordan Palmer, his quarterback coach, was there. Jordan Palmer, also the quarterback coach for the likes of Joe Burrow, Josh Allen. And so so Joe, Jordan Palmer's been through this process with these bigger quarterbacks. Um, of course, Joe Burrow was more accurate throughout at LSU where Josh Allen was inaccurate. So we've seen both sides of the fence, um, and I think that's going to be one of the things that really helps Will through this process. Again, Will's still my quarterback one, and I'm going to stick by that. But that doesn't mean that Will's going to be the best quarterback in 2023. I think that's going to be C.J. Stroud. I've said that all along, that he's the most pro-ready, and I think that's a lock um, that C.J. Stroud is that number one overall pick for the Carolina Panthers. We'll be doing a 2023 NFL mock draft tonight, mock draft live at 7.30 p.m., me and Matty Kiwum. We've been doing rookie mocks. Um, on Sunday nights, Tuesday nights, and Friday nights. And they've all been rookie mocks so far, but tonight we're doing an NFL mock draft, all 31 picks of round one, and then we're going to have a 30-second pick just so we can hit all 32. Pittsburgh Steelers pick 33. But more so, we're going to go through all these picks, and I think that C.J. Stroud is the the, the one lock at, at 101 right now that the Carolina Panthers they're building this team to be good. They need a quarterback that they can plug in tomorrow and play. Um, they're not going to roll out Andy Dalton in 2023 because they need to win. They need to win. This is their division to take in 2023, and, and C.J. Stroud is the guy that I think can come in and do that from day one. So if you're in the chat, I appreciate you guys. If you have any questions, drop a comment. I'll I'll see what's going on. Um, but really, today we're going to go through the NFL Draft Big Board. We'll talk through the NFL Mock Draft Index. Um, we'll talk about the order, of course, and some trades and, and things like that, as well as as well as a little bit of a recap from the Virginia Pro Day. Um, from Tuesday, I went down to Virginia for the Pro Day. I was going to go to Liberty on Monday. I did not go, or did I go Wednesday? I think it might have been Wednesday. I don't know. I got my days all mixed up. But nonetheless, the Virginia Pro Day was this week. Um, but let's get to it. All right, first things first, the NFL Draft Big Board. You can find the big board over at playerprofiler.com. I'll also drop it in the chat right now, see if you can use that link. The Draft Big Board, it's it's Draft Big Board season, right? We're officially one month away. We're four weeks away from the NFL Draft in Kansas City. We're setting up plans right now to be in Kansas City for the draft. We've got a draft house all booked out. It's going to be a content house. We're going to be doing a bunch of shows live in person. I know we got the players' lounge is going to be there in person. I'm not going to do it live. Uh, I'll probably do the I, got, I think our trade gods show with me, Maddie Kuhn, and Jason Allwine is going to be live. Of course, we're going to have the draft stream. Player profile today will be live if Jack can get his ass down here from Canada, and uh, probably Wake can take if Jason's down there and he's going to be live as well. I think we're going to have a lot of shows going while we're live in KC. I'm 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 jacked. I'm excited. And I'm ready to be down there. But first things first, it's four weeks away. Big board season is here where the official grades are starting to roll in. The NFL rookie draft guide, <clears throat> draft rookie guide will be out. Goal is end of next week, April 1 goal. Um, but first things first, I got to get these grades in. These grades are coming through right now. You can see the link in the chat. The NFL draft big board at playerprofile.com. Top of the top of the screen, hit the NFL draft button, and then it gives you the draft order, draft index, draft big board, and mock draft analysis. You can see the big board. If you click all positions right now, there's only a handful of defenders in here because I'm finishing grading. Like I, I went through a preliminary, and then I go back through and I finish out the, the athletic testing that comes in that plugs that number in and gives me the official grade, and then I plug in some dog rating things that finish that out. It gives me some 
some uh, end goal grades. Um, but so mostly right now it's quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, and a few defenders are plugged in right now. So today I'm going to focus on quarterback, running back, and tight end. Uh, currently on the big board, we have 135 players prospected out. Um, so starting at the top, all the way from Bijan Robinson, Jalen Carter, Nolan Smith, all the way down to the bottom with pick 135, Ladarius, 238 pound Jefferson from Western Michigan. Uh, he ran like I think he ran like a four nine or something or four nine five or something at the Western Michigan Pro Day. I want to say, um, so yeah, all the way down to him. I think that's forty running backs that we have in this twenty five tight ends, twenty five quarterbacks. The twenty fifth quarterback is James Blackman, twenty four Chase Bryce, things like that. So we'll go through this. If you got any questions about any of these players in in, in, in particular, please drop a comment and let me know who you want me to talk about. I see some people in the chat already. I uh, appreciate you guys coming in here, Joey, two times. Hey, Connor, what's good? Hope all is good with you. Thoughts on Chark to the Panthers? Chark to the Panthers obviously has been talked about for the last couple weeks. <clears throat> it's funny. This is this would be my comment on Chark. Obviously, I love the landing spot. I think Chark perfectly fits in there um, because he's plug and play. Uh, right now you have Thielen, you got T-Marsh, you got Hayden Hurst, you got Miles Sanders, now you got DJ Chark. And I think Chark takes that stretch role. I think Thielen can play anywhere in this offense, and I think Marshall is probably a prototypical X in this offense. I think that's their goal is to make T-Marsh the X, uh, even though I don't think any of these three will be Xs. I think you have two twos. I think you have Chark's a two. I think Marshall's a two, and then I think you have Thielen, who's going to play a lot of slot, and he's going to be a, just a dog at three. Hayden Hurst obviously can play a little slot, and then Miles Sanders and Chuba in the backfield. Should be nice. Should be a good uh, good bevy of weapons for C.J. Stroud. So I, I like the landing spot for him. He's going to continue to be a, a best ball guy for me. But number first things first I want to say is one of my big takeaways from the last month and a half is that it seems these deals have been getting done sooner than they're, they've been being been a have been been announced. So first off, we talk about the Aaron Rodgers thing. Rodgers said last Wednesday, this deal's been done already, right? And and that wasn't the first time we heard this. The Adam Thielen deal happened last week. There was already rumors of him being signed the week before that. DJ Chark, Thielen talked about that one last week when he was on the Pat McAfee show. This deal was already like pretty much in place, and Chark was – Last week, it was rumored Chargers were going to sign. The other one is a Delvin Cook trade. Delvin Cook uh, caught a little buzz last week. And from the source that I know uh, in Minnesota, has said that this deal is pretty much done. He's like, this deal is done. The, the trade is in place. Similar to this Rodgers one. The Rodgers one just hasn't been announced yet. Um, and you think back to like last year when when the, the Burks to, not the Burks, the Brown to Philadelphia trade. That trade had been talked about weeks going in, and it was pretty much finalized before the draft happened. Um, but... Per sources, uh, Dalvin Cook uh, pretty much is on the outs. He's, it, the deal is pretty much like the ink is drying right now, um, but that's been for like a week already known. So we'll see when that actually comes out and is, is announced. So it's just one of those weird things that my takeaway from this Chark thing, I should say, is that these deals are like done way earlier. And I don't know if that's just this year or like if it's been been like this for the last couple of years. I guess I'm just now noticing it, but the deals are happening and then it's kind of like getting thrown in the rug and then it pops back up. And, and we're just finally like seeing it through the through the vines, but it's just an interesting thing. Maddie Kiwoom, Will Levis Day, aka shout out Cody's Christmas. Uh, I thought I was late, just in time. No, just in time, brother. I was uh, watching a little uh, watching a little Will Levis on my other screen over here. Uh, yes, Jordan Palmer. Who thought Will Levis is who we thought Josh Allen really was, and that's light skinned Jamarcus Russell says Optimus Prime. That's an aggressive take. Is the is the Terrace Marshall dream dead finally? No, like I said, I just think I think they're both number twos. I think poor LaVisca Chenault. Poor LaVisca Chenault is the one that's eating the crow because of uh, Adam Thielen, Hayden Hurst being in there. Last question I'll take for now. What's good? Thoughts on Gibbs versus Charbs in half PPR? Half PPR, you're going to lean a little more towards Charbs, but I'll talk about that when in the leading weeks. Charbs, I'm not as high on. If you look at the draft big board, this is NFL-based. Uh, Gibbs comes in RB3. Charbs comes in RB6. I know it's pretty consensus for a lot of these people out here that have Charbs and Gibbs 2 and 3 back-to-back, but not for your boy. Um, Will Levis is going to take too many hits and get receivers killed over the middle. Disagree. Should we be happy with Jason's 40 time? 100,000%. Anything below 455, I was going to be happy with. He cracked in the 448s, 44 in the cracked into the 44s uh, for a lot of scouts. So I'm happy with that. What's good, all then? Appreciate you guys all coming in here, clap, tapping that like button, tapping the subscribe, and hitting the bell. Don't forget tonight, 7 30 Eastern time, mock draft live. Me and Maddie Keown will be live. 
doing the NFL mock draft, all 32 picks for round one. Let's take a listen to one of our sponsors and then we'll hit back and we'll go through this big board. You know, people always ask me, hey, what is the the World Series of fantasy or the Super Bowl of fantasy football? And it's easy. It's the FFPC, the Fantasy Football Players Championship. It's a $6 million prize pool. And they've had their never too early best ball leagues cranking since February. And so the FFPC is the answer to so many questions. Hey, hey, where's the best place to get a dynasty orphan? Well, you can adopt a dynasty orphan at the FFPC. That's why we partner with them. If you want to play fantasy football for low, medium, high stakes, seasonal, best ball, dynasty, go to the FFPC. And don't forget, promo code UNDERWORLD to get you $25 off your first team. $25 off your first team, no matter what team it is, no matter what format it is, at the FFPC. Go do it. Hey, we're back. FFPC drafting. Shout out to the Podfather. Now, let's jump into this big board really quickly. And I want to just talk about some of the big takeaways that I had going through my grades and seeing kind of where these guys landed. First things first, Jameer Gibbs is not my RB2. It's Kendra Miller. And when you're looking at the grades for these guys, I'll pull up my grade sheet right now and I can talk you through exactly why it shook out this way. Kendra Miller comes in with a 7.31. Jameer Gibbs comes in with a 7.29. When I look at these guys in context of tiers, uh, the clear tier break for me um, is one Bijan, tier one, and then tier two is Kendra and Jameer Gibbs. Um, I had Kendra's play style comp best comparable to Javante Williams, 7.51, 7.229 for Jameer Gibbs. Both of these guys end up in that um, round two talent and year two upside kind of a, of a landing spot. Gibbs has slight of frame. I know the speed's there, but this light of frame, everyone's comparing him to Elvin Kamara, but Kamara's, again, 215 pounds. We've been over this before, um, but that's not the big takeaway. The big takeaway for me is that Tank Bigsby did, in fact, uh, put himself back into that top five c- consideration. Not only did he put himself in the top five, he cracked a 7.00 scale for me in grading and ended up RB4 ahead of Roshan Johnson. I did not expect this. He jumped Roshan. He jumped Charbonnet. I figured he would he would probably be in the lower end uh, of the top 10, um, more into this Tyja Spears conversation. But I have Tank Bigsby coming in at 208. Uh, he ran the four fours. If I bring up his player page right now, I can see... Six foot, two hundred and ten pounds. I like that. I love that. And I think he ran four four eight. I want to say four five six. We have him as right now, but I think he ran a little quicker than that as pro day. We haven't got the pro day numbers tapped in yet on player profile, but they're kind of in the process of doing that. Shout out to Jack and John, uh, among others that are tapping into those numbers. Uh, my player. Play style comp for Tank Bigsby was Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones, I give him a 23 and a half film grade, um, which was fifth on this list as well, just behind Gibbs and Kendra. Gibbs did have a higher film grade overall, um, but I love where Tank is. And I see some comments in here about Tank under 450, what happened to his value, um, and, and really where um, Tank belongs in the whole grand scheme. And we've had these uh, conversations as well before. And that Tank was always in the conversation with Bijan at the top, and then he kind of faded back. But would you look at Tank's profile and what Tank brings to the table, um, best comparable to Damian Pearson player profiler, three straight, three straight thousand all-purpose yard seasons at Auburn. Um, coming out as a junior, he's 21 and a half years old. I think Tank's a guy right now that's kind of getting ignored and, and, and kind of low-key in the, in, the, in the grand scheme of the NFL draft industrial complex. When the NFL draft rolls around, I think you're going to see a guy like Tank end up being uh, in that early fourth round as far as where he really does get drafted by the NFL. And I think that's a good spot for him. I think you're going to see a lot of guys get drafted in that late third through the entire fourth round at the running back position. Uh, but yeah, Tank ends up in tier three for me. So that's number one, B. John Robinson. Two, three is Kendra Miller in tier two. And then three, four, five in tier three is Tank Bigsby, Roshan Johnson, and Zach Charbonnet. Now you drop down to tier four at the running back position. And of course, Devon A. Chain's there with his speed. He has a 6.79 overall grade. The 6.79 puts him in that round one to three talent spectrum and in a boom bust. Uh, that's kind of where I define. So a lot of these are, are defined as, you know, what is my grading scale? The scale is it's broken down into number one overall talent, top three talent, top 10 talent, first round talent, late first to second, second round, first to third, 
with a boom bust rate. And then fourth round is developmental with projection and fifth round is developmental with a dart throw and then so on and so forth. Um, so when I'm looking at guys like Devon A. Chain, Tion Evans from Louisville, and Tyja Spears from Tulane being 6'7", 5", 6'7", 8", 6'7", 9", they all fit right in that boom bust here uh, in round one to three talent. And I think Tion being in there surprised me, and it surprised a lot of people. But when the dog grades came out, and I tweeted this last night uh, on over on Twitter, the number one dog grade in this entire class, and this, this has been my best tweet in the last 24 hours, has been Tion Evans from the University of Louisville. I can bring it up right now. Uh, 7.8 was the dog rating for Tion Evans at the running back position last year. Uh, that would have ranked him fourth at the running back position behind Damian Pierce, who had a 9-0, Kenneth Walker at a 7-9, and Isaiah Pacheco at a 7-9. So um, I, I said this is he's this year's you know Damian Pierce, but he didn't he's not quite on that same level. I think he's probably closer to like this year's Zonovan Knight. He's like Zonovan Knight with some dog in him. Uh, as far as expectation goes, uh, do I see him being as big of a contributor as Isaiah Pacheco? No. Do I see him big, being as big of a contributor as Damian Pierce out the gate? No. But do I think he's definitely going to be a riser through this entire process and a guy you need to be throwing darts on from the fantasy perspective in like the fourth and fifth round 100% every single time? Uh, we're currently doing a rookie mock draft uh, at Player Profiler with all the analysts and uh, – Tion, that's going to be my 4.03 rookie pick right there in this mock draft because i got to make a point, man. Tion deserves to be up in that conversation, and I think that's, uh, again, straight up just needs to be there. Tier 5 is where the big tier comes in. This is a big tier of dudes um, all the way from Israel Abanacanda, Zach Evans fits in here, Sean Tucker, Eric Gray, Evan Hull, Deuce Vaughn. Keaton Mitchell, a lot of people love Keaton Mitchell from East Carolina. He's also really tiny. I actually didn't even compare him to a running back and compared him to Tavon Austin. I think Tavon Austin's a good comp for him as well. Another guy that's in this list is Daenerik Prince from Tulsa. Uh, compared him to um, Marlon Mack. You look up Daenerik Prince, and, and, and he's best comparable to Samir White on player profiler. And when you look at where Daenerik Prince is probably going to end up in the NFL draft, it's probably going to be in that late area, kind of where Zamir went last year to the Las Vegas Raiders. And he ran a 4-4-1. Zamir went in the fourth round, put Daenerik in the fifth or sixth round. I think that's a good spot for him. Uh, he's a big body bruiser. Still, people aren't really talking about him. Six foot, 216 pounds, the most athletic player in this class, the running back position, and uh, 119 all time out of 670 running backs at playerprofiler.com. You look at the athleticism score, the real athleticism score at playerprofiler.com. Go to the player page and scroll down just a titch, and it's right there. Another running back I want to talk about that's in tier five, and then we'll move on to the next position is Aiden Borgay. Aiden Borgay, I think I spelled that name right. I think I'm saying it right. Shout out to him. He went to Harvard, so he doesn't need a shout out because he's extremely smart. But Aiden Borgay from Harvard is a guy I think I'm most excited for this year. Let me bring up his page right now. Um, testing still isn't in. That's cool. I think he's this year's Jalen Warren. Um, I watched him for a long time yesterday, and – my biggest takeaway was just his, his straight up running style and what Borgay brings. He's got a small frame, quick steps, almost as Austin Eckler type like in space, um, ability to keep his feet and legs churning while in between tackles and bounce out with burst and acceleration downfield. Great lower body power with vision and patience uh, to create space and create uh, missed tackles at the next level. I think Borgay is a guy you just turn the tape on and you just enjoy everything you're watching. And it reminded me of Jalen Warren where Jalen Warren last year, I graded him a, a bit low, but when I went back and watched Jalen Warren's college tape um, this spring, I was like, yeah, and I, I could clearly see where I missed him. And, and then I, it was one of those recollections where I go, all right, I saw Jalen Warren again. I watched his college tape back and then I come to Aiden Borgay and I'm like, Oh, Oh, that's Jalen Warren. Now I remember why I missed on Jalen Warren, but at the same time, why I shouldn't have missed on Jalen Warren. It's just kind of those 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 factors that when you see a guy that might look slower, he might look like he's got um, uh, you know, too tight a lower body, too too big a too big a quads. Really, is what it what it came down to. I think with Borgay, I thought his lower body yeah, is kind of weird, but I got to look up what he ran in his forty because I think he ran pretty fast. I think they just had their pro day like last week. Four five eight, so right in that same area. Four five eight's not bad. Thirty six inch vertical. This is what the, the big one was. He's number one right now among all pro day numbers that are coming in for the bench press at running back. Thirty five reps at the bench. 
35 for a running back that's five foot eight, 205 pounds. So, I, I mean, does does bench press translate to running backs? No, but I'm telling you, like he's a he's a fucking bruiser. He's a tank, and uh, I think that that's just going to be an opportunity for him. So, Aiden Borgay does come in. Uh, it's not like he's overly high for me. I think he came in RB 16. Yeah, right there, right uh, behind Evan Hole, right ahead of Keaton Mitchell, right ahead of Deuce Vaughn, that same area. And then rounding out the top 20, we'll just say Kalen LeBorn. Kalen LeBorn and Hassan Hall were 19 and 20 at the running back position. Let's move over to tight end, though, for now. Got through all the running backs. If you have any questions about running backs, drop them in here and I'll answer them really quickly. Uh, Connor Porter says, Thoughts on Jaden Reed when you get a wide receiver, when you get to wide receivers, please. Um, I'll touch on Jaden Reed here in a minute when I get to wide receivers for sure. Does anyone have JSN not ranked as the wide receiver one? No, I don't think they do. I think that's, I mean, that's the easiest thing. That's the easiest bet this entire season is having JS one. JSN, the only question was if he runs four six six, then you think you have to be like, okay, uh, okay. Uh, is he is his ceiling? What is, is his ceiling? Like Adam Thielen, um well, not so Adam Thielen slash Keenan Allen. Like, does he have to hit that threshold of I think I think I think Keenan Allen ran like a four six four, I want to say something like this. Like he would have to be every bit of Keenan Allen to hit and be Keenan Allen. Otherwise, he's just going to be another slot guy that just doesn't hit. But the three cone was unbelievable. The shuttle was unbelievable. The routes have been unbelievable at the combine and at the pro day. And he doubled down, hit the 40, uh, hit the 4-4. Four, four. So I think the wheels are completely up and off the ground for JSN. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, but let's talk about the, what did I say, tight ends now. I'm going to bring up tight ends. A couple interesting dudes here. Um, one, uh, that had a little bit of a pro day note that goes into the dog rating more than anything is, is obviously because there's a lot of in-person stuff with that is Darnell Washington. Darnell Washington's not going to be as high as, as a lot of people expect him to be. Um, I know the NFL currently is talking about uh, having Darnell Washington. Um, I just fucked up the whole list. Having Darnell Washington near the um, top and being one of the first tight ends drafted not there anymore. I'm not there. At one point I was there. That was before I saw him in person at the combine. I got a little worried. And then I saw him in person again at the Georgia pro day. I got a little more worried, bumped him down a little bit more currently have Darnell Washington tied, tied for tight end five. Number one's Michael Mayer. No surprise. Number two is Luke Musgrave. Kincaid's taking a little bit of a hit. He's down at a 7.15. When you're looking at the NFL draft, big board at playerprofiler.com. It's it's tough. Kincaid's tough for me because a lot of NFL evaluators right now are projecting him to be up into that range where the Jets are drafting, where Green Bay is drafting, where Washington's drafting, 13, 15, 16. And I don't fully agree with this. It's it's kind of the inverse of, of the Jalen Hyatt thing where a lot of people are starting to put Jalen Hyatt in the second round of the NFL mock drafts, whereas they're putting Dalton Kincaid, 13, 15, 16. I think that's flipped. I think Kincaid should be a second round pick, an early second round pick. He's been injured this entire process with a back injury. How many times have we seen a guy deal with a back injury through the entire rookie draft process or the NFL draft process and then just like get pushed up the board the entire time while he's hurt? That doesn't make any sense to me. We haven't seen testing. We haven't seen a good bill of health. And uh, just truthfully, I'm just not there on Dalton Kincaid. I have him as, as tight end three and he just keeps, you know, he's falling a little bit day to time, day to time. He's down at the 7.15 area. And when you look at what that brings with the grading, it puts him as a boom bust first, first to third round talent, boom bust, because I think he's a boom bust. You look at the frame, you look at what he brings to the table overall, Dalton Kincaid, six foot four, 240 pounds. If he is six foot four, 240 pounds, I think he could be closer to that six, three, six, two area, really kind of how he plays. He doesn't play like, like, a, like a George Kittle. I don't think, um, in my opinion, anyways, he's 23 and a half years old. Whereas Michael Mayer's 21 and a half Musgrave's 22 and a half Tucker craft is 22 and a half Darnell's 21 and a half Sam Laporta's 22 and a half. This oldest guy out of this entire group. Okay, well, maybe he's the most refined and most ready. I agree. He's a great route runner, probably the great best route runner out of all these tight ends in this class. But again, he's not healthy. We need health. How many times have we went through a process and watched a guy deal with injuries and get pushed down? Oh, it's a back injury. Of all things, it's a back injury. How many tight ends have dealt with back injuries for the last 10 years in the NFL? This guy hasn't even been in the NFL yet. 
That's kind of like my, my, my biggest issues right now is that Kincaid's not getting any of the flack that people have been getting over the last 10 years because he's a great route runner and because he's going to be able to play a receiver. Well, so can Hayden Hurst and and, and so can Mike Gusecki. Is that what you want? Just because he's a great route runner because he's going to play in the slot? I, I just think that's a that's a it's a it's a dangerous line to toe. Um, now it's not saying that that Kincaid's bad because he's not bad at all. He's super athletic, great body type, great footwork, great agility, yak. He grinds. It, like, it's all there. Everything's there for Kincaid. It's just the health. The health is the big the big thing for me right now. So Tucker Craft comes in at number four. Sam Laporta from Iowa comes in tight end five. Very similar to Trey McBride I thought from last year. Yak.com. Uh, Sam Laporta. That's kind of what comes up when you type yak.com into the computer screen. And then Darnell Washington comes in tied with a 6.52 rating uh, with Sam Laporta. Um, again, Mercedes Lewis type. I put Antonio Gates a while back. I'm, I'm deleting that from the board as far as uh, what he is. Um, I put Rodonculus size when he's healthy on the field. He looks like Shaquille O'Neal. The ball skills are there. Um, the one thing I did notice at the Georgia Pro Day was that Stetson Bennett was fucking awesome at putting the ball exactly where Darnell needed to catch it, right? To make Darnell look good, he could put the ball here, which is testament to Stetson being a great teammate because it's not going to make him look great. It's going to put the ball playing against air where Darnell needs it to look good, right? And Darnell looked good, but it wasn't it wasn't always well, as she says, it wasn't always between the lines or or when the play was happening that he looked good. It was after that when when he was just moseying around, and it wasn't that he was moseying around because he's like lazy. It was more that he looked he didn't look like he was healthy. We talk about health with Dalton Kincaid. Washington doesn't look like he's 100 percent healthy. Uh, he looks like he's got like some knee problems. He looks like he's got some back issues. Like maybe that's just how he kind of operates because he's such a massive body, six seven, two sixty five. Could be, um, but I just wasn't really impressed with. Um, what I thought was a freak athlete on tape, what I thought was a massive, massive human being and freaky uh, next level, something we've never seen before. Um, I've seen people that size before more athletic. That's that's kind of what surprised me was Washington wasn't quite that <clears throat> quite that athletic in person as as you kind of portrayed on film. So Washington came down quite a bit, uh, a lot, just through the process of seeing him twice now at the Combine and at the Georgia Pro Day. The next guy in line here is a very interesting one to me. That's Daniel Barker. Daniel Barker, a tight end from Michigan State, played at Illinois, went to Michigan State this last season. Daniel Barker, you ever heard of Daniel Barker? Um, you need to. You need to type in Daniel Barker right now, and you need to go watch from Daniel Barker because he didn't do a lot. He didn't put a lot on wax, as our boy Ray G would say. Um, but what he did do, came in 243, 6'3", decent. 80 and 7 eighths inch wingspan, 33 and a half inch arms, 10 and a quarter inch hands. He had a 34 inch vertical for a tight end, pretty solid. 16 reps on the bench, nearly a 10 foot broad jump, but didn't quite hit it. And then a 475, which is a respectable 40 for Daniel Barker. But Daniel Barker, um, when you turn on the tape, I just like everything that I saw from Daniel Barker. And I think he comes in right here at 6.51, um, and he kind of just vaulted himself into the conversation of Payne Durham and Josh Wiley, two guys that I saw down at the Senior Bowl. Um, Barker, great athleticism down the steam, burst and acceleration uh, to open the field. Ability to maneuver and make moves around with great catch radius, a, a fantastic catch radius, I thought. Uh, he's got a little, little hip tightness, and that's really what kind of I, I didn't love. Um that's more so it's it's him waiting to get the ball uh, and in and, and finding space. Um, I think when he's in space, he's fine. When he's trying to find spaces where he struggles a little bit, but he did come in higher on the dog rating for the tight end position. I haven't finalized and sorted through all the dog rating. Let's do, let's do it live right here. How about we do that? We'll do it live right now. I can, I can figure out what the – I had the numbers set. I just need to pull them. I'll do this for you guys live on stream. And we'll see if we can figure out who the number one tight end is. I think it's Barker. Barker is number two behind uh, Barker. Yeah, Barker's number two, seven point two one uh, for Barker. Number two in the dog rating scale. Perfect, great spot for him to land. Exactly what I kind of projected. Kind of that's kind of what lifted him throughout this entire grading scale and brought him up now to tight end number seven, right behind Darnell Washington, right ahead of Payne Durham, right ahead of Josh Wiley. I advise you to go turn on some Daniel Barker. Um, 
just kind of based on what he brings to the table, there's not a lot, right? He went to Illinois. They didn't use him much, but he set the tight end record for touchdowns scored at Illinois, and then he went to Michigan State this last year, had 239 yards on 21 receptions, scored two more touchdowns, and played with Jaden Reed. Um, and he was the fourth leading receiver on the team behind Keon Coleman and Jaden Reed. Daniel Barker, outperformed Malik Carr. Go turn him on. I think you'll enjoy what you watch. Rumor, tight end Washington to play offensive tackle. So this is the problem. Again, I thought back at the Senior Bowl this was bullshit, but then I talked to some people, and they said that they were actually considering him to play tackle after the combine, after that workout. And I was like, how could you possibly look at that workout and say tight end? And I was thinking about it in the wrong context. What I should have been saying is how can you look at that frame in the lower half and consider him to be a tackle? But in that conversation, I said, okay, so where would you draft him? And the executive said, I wouldn't draft him. If I wanted him to play tackle, I wouldn't draft him because you can't because he's a project. He's Ooh, we had a little ad action popping up. Am I still on the screen? I can't see myself anymore. Comment if you can hear me. Damn. Damn, we frozen. All right, let's see if we can switch this Wi-Fi up quick. Yo, 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 we coming. I'm trying to fix this thing. All right. Did I get connected? I think I got connected to uh, – I'm plugged in now. I was not plugged in before. All right, back to the stream. I appreciate you guys dropping the comments in here to get me get me back. We here. We here. We're back. We're not frozen anymore. The hair is looking fantabulous. Um, all right. What was I talking about? Washington to play tackle. Yes. So the theory was that this executive told me was that – if Washington was to play tackle, we wouldn't draft him. We would project him as a tackle. We would want to work him in as a tackle, and that would cause us to not want to spend any draft capital on him. So that would mean that 32 teams would be, have to be in uh, agreement that this guy is so shitty as a tight end, you have to move him to tackle. I don't think there's going to be 32 guys that think that. I think there's going to be somebody out there that uh, believes that they can, they can mold him into the next Gronkowski or some shit like this. Is he that? No. Like I said, I think when you look at, at Kincaid, um, I think if, you know, Kincaid, the way his stock has continued to grow through this process, despite him not doing jack shit, I think equally as it would have benefited Darnell Washington to not do anything through this entire process in order to get to stay in that round one com con conversation. This is ridiculous. This is fucking awesome. Maybe we should exile of some shit. Fuck it. We'll do it live. Are we back? All right, we'll just keep going. Old school radio style, Sean R. in the chat. Appreciate you. I'm just going to keep on rolling through here. We talked about tight ends. Like I said, we got through Darnell Washington, Sam Laporta. Daniel Barker comes in at the tight end seven position. Rounding out the top ten, you look at it. Payne Durham, Josh Wiley, Leonard Taylor. Leonard Taylor is the guy from the NFL Combine that I discussed. Uh, wanted to be the Walter Payton Man of the Year award. That was one of his main goals. That, that goes far when you have a major in – interdisciplinary studies, a minor in real estate. I don't know why I read that that way. A minor in criminal justice and a certificate in sports coaching. And you want to be the Walter Payton man of the year award. And you compare yourself to Darren Waller. I love you. 
go to the top. That's all I want to hear. Uh, I think his play style reminds me a little of Max Williams. He's got it between the ears. He wants to be good. He wants to be great. And he comes in right there at tight end 10. Just ahead of my boy Braden Willis, who you guys know I love Braden Willis because of his, his run blocking ability. And then 11-12 are two sleepers, two guys that are going to fit right in that con- uh, that consideration that I t- discussed before where uh, boom bust and, and I think 6.37 and 6.34 put them right there. Uh, actually, they missed the, the boom bust here, and they actually ended up in the development, developmental and projection, which makes a lot more sense based on what I was talking about. Because Kuntz and Strange, Strange at Penn State, we haven't seen a lot of him. I have him comparable to Austin Hooper. And then Zach Kuntz from Old Dominion, who's got his pro date today, comparable to Charlie Kohler, obviously the number one most athletic tight end in the history of the database at playerprofile.com. Six foot seven, 255 pounds. Kuntz, Kohler, it makes sense. Limited after the catch due to balance and extended to keep up right. Um, but the four five speed does not show up on tape. And that's really what worries me. But do I think that that matters in the NFL in the grand scheme? No, I think Kunz will be a fourth or fifth round pick. And I think that he is a guy that you're going to want to mold and you can build around because he uh, portrays better off the field and on the field and is more athletic and more uh, tameable than is a Darnell Washington. So instead of Darnell Washington, I think the biggest takeaway here is don't take Darnell Washington in the first or second round. Take Kunz in the fifth round of the NFL draft and smile while you're doing it. Let's move on to quarterback and then we'll finish out with a little wide receiver action. Number one, first things first, Jackson Smith and Jigba has that fantastic pro day the other day at the Ohio State. I think that was yesterday or day before. Doesn't matter here nor there. He runs. He runs the 40, 4.48 at the pro day, six foot tall, 196 pounds. And when you look at what that 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 brings to the table for him in the grand scheme of the NFL and being comparable to the last few draft classes. It, it it really vaults him from a, con- a conversation like we talked about before with a Keenan Allen type, uh, an Adam Thielen type, and a Mon Ross St. Brown type to being more athletic than an Amon Ross St. Brown and bringing more to the table than an Amon Ross St. Brown because Amon Ross wins in different ways where Jackson Smith and Jigba is so, so clean and so pure um, throughout his entire process. He came out with an 8.44 grade. Uh, Jamar Chase two years ago had a 9.30 for me. Jackson Smith and Jigba has an 8.44. Chris Olave had an 8.37 last year. He was my number one wide receiver. And then Bateman two years ago at 8.35. Garrett Wills an 8.24. So it kind of tells you where Smith and Jigba ended up. 8.44. Olave 8.37. Garrett Wilson 8.24. Uh, right in that same exact range. So I'm kind of happy with where he came out, kind of exactly where I assumed he would, especially when the athleticism got plugged in there. Quinton Johnson next on this reel, 8.09, the same exact score that Sky Moore got last year, uh, number two in the class. Number three in the class was not Jordan Addison. I have Zay Flowers with an 8.01, right where I put Traylon Burks in 2022. Uh, But when you look at the wide receiver position, biggest takeaways is – the list stays the same at the top, right? You have Smith and Jigba, Quentin Johnston, Zay Flowers is three. Jordan Addison took a big hit down to 7.52. 7.52 is a full half point lower than the 801 that Zay Flowers got at a run, at wide receiver three. And a 7.52 puts him as a, as a late first to early second round pick where I know the NFL likes Jordan Addison, but um, a few things off the field as far as the communication goes, as far as the dog rating goes, I didn't love. What Addison brought to the table, I do think Addison will be good in the NFL. I think he's going to be a great pro. Again, wide receiver four. I just took him off of that wide receiver tier, that tier one tier. That's now just Jackson. Jackson's the tier. Tier two, Quentin, Zay, tier three. Then it's Addison. That's where I. That's kind of where I ended up at the wide receiver position. And then a little bit further down from him is Josh Downs with a 7.40. Uh, still comparable to Jalen Waddle. I think... Uh, Downs was gonna Downs almost plummeted at the combine, but he saved himself during the workouts. Uh, get the ball into his hands. That's all I say. Get the ball into his hands. The burst is elite. The route running and the wiggle and what he can do with and without the ball is next level. Past him, Kayshawn Butte, 7.24, and Jalen Hyatt, 7.20. Hyatt was a little higher than I expected, but that makes sense. Um, just based on I mean, I talked about it on Twitter today. Uh, why uh, I think that uh Jalen Hyatt should be getting a little more respect uh, from the, as you'd call it, the NFL draft industrial complex or the, the, uh, yeah, pretty much the mock draft industrial complex. And that is just knowing what we, knowing what you know. I've said this multiple times. Know what you know. 
for those mocking in the NFL draft, NFL mock drafts going through these Jalen Hyatt in round two of the NFL draft, what part of the blow images would tell you that Jalen Hyatt is not a top 20 pick in the NFL's eyes? And again, we're not trying to mock what we would expect. Tonight, me and Maddie, we might do that. But when you're doing a mock draft, it's not what you would expect. It's what you actually believe the NFL is going to do. And what has the NFL done over the last four years? Speed. Olave, Jamison Williams, Jahan Dodson, Christian Watson. Speed, speed, speed. Christian Watson, a fifth-year guy from a small school, fifth-year breakup from a small school that runs hellaciously fast, goes 34th overall. And you mean to tell me that a third-year guy that broke out at Tennessee and ran a 4-4-0 that had the 23.6 mile per hour speed at the combine, which is number one? What are we doing here? 34th overall for Watson. You guys think Hyatt's going to fall below that? How about the year before that? Devonta Smith, fourth-year breakout Heisman. He had like 11 or 1,200 yards as a junior. Yeah, that's a breakout. But the big, big season where he was the best receiver in football was his fourth year. Hyatt did it his third year. Henry Ruggs, the year before that, 24.3 miles per hour. Not driving. Running. 124 miles an hour. 24.3 miles per hour for for Henry Ruggs in college. 23.6 for Jalen Hyatt. The speed's on par. Ruggs went 12th overall. The year before that, McCole Hardman, 56th overall. Really? like That's really where we're at right now, McCole Hardman? I think Jalen Hyatt, 30-year breakout at a big school, 30-year bullet in a cop forward winner, 23.6 miles per hour, 4-4-0 is fast enough. Jalen Hyatt's going to go in round one. Green Bay, Chargers, Minnesota, Jacksonville, the Giants, Dallas, Kansas City, Buffalo. Like, there's a lot of spots for him in round one. You need to open your eyes to that. I've just seen too many mock drafters have Jalen Hyatt <clears throat> in the round two. I don't like Jalen Hyatt. I wouldn't draft him if I wasn't. I don't say I don't like him. I don't like him for an NFL team. I don't like him for fantasy football. I don't like him in those contexts. Do I think he's a fine receiver? Do I think he's better than most in this class? Of course. I have him at wide receiver seven, right behind Keishon Butte, who also tied for the fastest miles per hour at the NFL Combine, 23.6. Shout out, Booty. DJ Moore Light. Now, after those two guys, it's down to Rashi Rice with the 7.12. He closes up that tier. That tier of guys right there from Booty, Hyatt and Rashi Rice, 7.12, because he came in 200 pounds. He ran fast enough. He looks great. He looks great on the field doing the routes, and he looked great at the SMU Pro Day. Then there's a tier break. The tier break goes down to Xavier Hutchinson, Jaden Reed, Trey Palmer, Jonathan Mingo, and Michael Wilson. Michael Wilson looked fantastic at the Senior Bowl. I'm just now realizing that that entire tier of Senior Bowl guys, Michael Wilson looked fantastic at the Senior Bowl. Jonathan Mingo had a better week. Jonathan Mingo just continues to grow through this entire process for me, 220 pounds. His best comparable list is ridiculous on the player profiler. Julio, A.J. Brown, Elm Lazard, who is his best comparable player. Uh, Mingo was just cons- cons- consistently grown through this entire process for me. Trey Palmer, of course, is going to have the number one dog rating among all wide receivers. Nothing else needs to be said about that. But there was a question in the chat about Jaden Reed. And Jaden Reed, for me, if he wasn't a, a, a old wide receiver, would be a little bit higher. That's the problem for me. He's going to be 23 years old. This whole list right here, Rashi's 22.9, Xavier Hutchinson's 22.8, Jaden Reed's 22.9. Um, nobody ahead of him other than Zay Flowers is 22 yet. And Reed's about to be 23. And that's where I'm sad. That's where I think Jaden Reed's going to get pushed down in the NFL. And in fantasy, he's been getting him. If, you, if you're drafting right now, if you're mock drafting on, on Sleeper especially, you can get Jaden Reed in the fifth round every single time because his ADP is like 999. It needs to be adjusted on Sleeper. Uh, so Sleeper, get after that. Uh, but Jaden Reed, I mean, not a lot needs to be said about Jaden Reed. I fucking love Jaden Reed. I love everything he brings to the table uh, from the return game. I think he lacks elite burst to get to that top speed. Just It's just a gradual acceleration, which isn't a problem. It's just it's less than ideal. Some of these other guys have that elite burst out of breaks. Strong hands, great awareness of his surroundings, great body control. Uh, Reed's a stud. I, I, he can fucking do everything. I wish he was a little bit heavier, but, but he can. He can he, Percy Harvin light. He compares himself to Kadarius Tony, and funny enough, when you look at the all-time grades, and you look at Jaden Reed, six point seven nine, 
Can anybody guess who has a 6.80 and was just, is just a titch ahead of him right now in the all-time grades for me for 2021, 2022, 2023? Comparing the last three classes together, Kadarius, Tony, 6.80, Jaden Reed, 6.79. It makes too much sense. I love me some Jaden Reed. Best comparable is to find digs on playerprofile.com. Jaden Reed is going to be on, I was going to say 100%, but I'll just say 88% of my dynasty leagues, dynasty drafts this season. I'm assuming I don't get sniped by everyone that's listening. Jaden Reed right there. Anybody else that grew through this process that I should note? Tyler Scott's right down there after after Michael Wilson. Dontavian Wicks at the Virginia Pro Day. We'll talk about him here in just a minute when I talk about the Virginia Pro Day. And then, of course, Charlie Football comes in. Charlie Football, probably a little lower than some of you guys expected. Wide receiver 18. Of course, he's 24, uh, almost 25 years old. Um, but that's kind of just where he ends up. And then right now, I still have a few wide receivers to get through. Um, a handful here, but Jalen Wayne, Ronnie Bell is the bottom of the tier. Those are the guys that, that did not crack the 6.0 threshold, for example. Um, but yeah, that's... So that's receiver, that's tight end, that's running back. Let's go to quarterback really quickly, and then we'll talk about this Virginia Pro Day. Pop-up quarterback on the big board at playerprofile.com. Again, I'll drop the link in the chat. If you're listening along, please feel free to go over there and check that list out. You can follow directly along on that list. My internet is ultra fast today. All right, guys, quarterback, we're here. Number one, Will Levis comes in with a 7.80. Again, if you just watched the Will Levis Pro Day, you're probably going to say, Cody, what the fuck are you talking about? Why is Will Levis your quarterback one? I've talked about this. I'm going to stay pat with what I said before. Will Levis, six foot three, two 232 pounds. He can make every single throw on the field. Yes, some of them are deranged at times but he stays number one for a couple of reasons. That being, Will Levis has the most upside from the NFL perspective at the quarterback position. He's the guy that if he hits, he will hit and he will be here for 14 years and he'll be playing at a high level and he will be talked about in tier one. Right now, the fantasy community, we're going to talk about these in two communities, the NFL draft community and the fantasy community. The fantasy community fucking hates Will Levis. They hate him. Everyone talks about, well, even if he hits, he's not going to have any value. False. Right now, he has no value. He almost has negative value. So where you can get him in Superflex drafts, I've gotten him a number of times over the last week, 1-8, 1-10, 1-7, 1-8, all in this range in the first round Superflex. I'm taking him every time at that price. Now, what you could also do is you could also see him get drafted if he continues to go in that range, let somebody else take him. And then by the time fall rolls around and he's not named the starting quarterback, you can draft, you can trade for him because everyone's like, oh, bust, he sucks. It's not about year one. It's never about year one for these guys. Josh Allen, it was year two. Patrick Mahomes, it was year two. This is what we're playing for. We're playing for this game where we don't want Will Levis to be thrown to the Wolves week one. You're playing for the Detroit game. You're playing for the. You're playing for Carolina. You're playing for the the Raiders. You're playing for uh, him to be sitting behind somebody for a handful of weeks. It, of course, you're not going to get the Alex Smith opportunity to sit behind somebody in Kansas City. He's going to get thrown to the Wolves more than likely, at least in some fashion. Kind of similar to Josh Allen. Josh Allen just got thrown out there. Patrick Mahomes had 17 weeks. I would assume it's going to be somewhere in between there. But what I'm saying is Will Levis has the highest range of outcomes. Yes, he can suck. He can be Blake Bortles, but he can also be your Josh Allen, your Patrick Mahomes. You need to understand that. I play from a projection standpoint. I'm projecting him to be as good as you could possibly be. Otherwise, I'd be doing myself, and I'd be doing you a disservice. Number two, C.J. Stroud with a 7.55, narrowly ahead of Anthony Richardson with a 7.46. I've said it all along. I think C.J. Stroud was a little limited at the passing from the passing aspect of what we saw in college, but he's shown through this process at the combine and at his pro day that he has a stronger arm than what he showed on film. Now, that could just be part of the process being at Ohio State. He didn't need to push the ball downfield. He didn't need to show that he had the strongest arm. He didn't need to make those tight area throws like Will Levis had to be forced into doing and forced to put the ball downfield as much. C.J. Stroud showed us Jared Goff. C.J. Stroud showed us Teddy Bridgewater through the entire process. But the last few weeks, he's shown more Derek Carr. He's shown in a, from a positive aspect. He's shown more um, 
Jared Goff. He's shown more Kirk Cousins. He showed more of that level of play. The problem with CJ Stroud is I don't think that the ceiling is to get up at a tier one. He's going to be consistently consistent. I think that's why Carolina takes him to run overalls because he can plug him in with Chark, with Thielen, with T-Marsh, with, Her- with Hayden Hurst, with Miles Sanders, and with a fantastic defense. And you can win now with CJ Stroud because he's from a winning program. I think that's why that's an easy smash. Um, of an overall grading pr- context, 7.8 for Levis, 7.55 for Stroud. Richardson comes in with a 7.46. Uh, for similar reasons to why Levis is number one, I have Richardson number three. We've talked about this multiple aspect, multiple times. In fantasy, he's going to be my number one because you're playing for rushing year one. Um, I've talked about this multiple times too where you want to focus year by year in dynasty. That's how I look at it, and especially in redraft. Well, Richardson, if he gets dumped into a spot where he has to play this year, I think he can. I think he can rush for 11, 12, 1,300 yards on the ground, and that's going to be top 10 viable in fantasy football. But in the NFL, wide receiver quarters, quarterback three just ahead of Anthony Richardson by a – sorry, ahead of Bryce Young by 0.1 for one reason. He's got a mixture of all of these guys, Cam, Lamar Jackson, Colin Kaepernick. He's got a dynamite arm, dynamite lower body, the frame, everything is there. Bryce Young coming in at quarterback four, 7.33, just a touch behind those guys. I've caught flag for it. I'll continue to catch flag for it, but I will make you beat me. I'm going to make Bryce Young beat me. And if he beats me, I'll be 100, 100% okay with Bryce Young beating me. But I'm going to make you beat me at 5'11", 195 pounds. Then I will bet on you at 5'11", 195 pounds. That's just not my archetype. That's not my prototype. That's not what I want. I want the build. I want the athleticism. I want the arm talent. And I'm betting on somebody like Jordan Palmer teaching it and coaching that to those prospects than I am of Bryce Young having the intangibles, having the talent, having it between the ears, but not having the frame and getting knocked out. I know he's got Lamar Laramie Tunsil there. Um, I know they're bringing an offensive lineman in Houston, and I think that's probably where he ends up. But I'm going to make you beat me with Bryce Young. I'm going to make you beat me in the NFL. I'm going to make you beat me in fantasy. And I'm going to roll with what I'm going to roll with the bet. I'm going to gamble on Will Levis. I'm going to gamble on Anthony Richardson. And if I'm not going to do that, I'm going to take what I know, and that's C.J. Stroud. So that's the easiest way that I can explain QB1 through QB4. Um, I've done it a couple times, but that's the best way that I could do it in the simplest terms is that I'm going to make Bryce Young beat me. I'm going to bet on Levis. Richardson's right there. And then number two, C.J. Stroud has to be number two because for a lot of people, he should be number one. But I don't think he has the it factor to jump into tier one, tier one in fantasy and in real life is the, the Mahomes, the Allen, that aspect. He can't jump to there. Do I think that Richardson can either? No, I think Richardson can get to where Lamar is. Lamar's not in that same tier because he hasn't had the arm talent. Levis has the arm talent. So I hope this makes a lot of sense. I hope this helped make a lot of sense to this quarterback breakdown. Um, past those guys, it's Hooker, and then Hooker, 6.96, and Tyson Bajant, 6.70. Quarterback, 6 for me in this process, followed by Stetson Bennett, climbs himself back up to QB, Seven. Now let's finish it out before we get to an hour here with the Virginia Pro Day. The Virginia Pro Day was good. Uh, I wanted to see Dontavian Wicks, see his improvements, see what he looked like um, through the process. He improved his forty-yard dash. He ran a four-six-two at the NFL Combine. <clears throat> at the NFL Combine, he ran a four-five-two at the Pro Day, so that changes to a four-five-seven. So it's a little bit of improvement. Um, Couple other guys that kind of were, were takeaways here. Uh, the big one was Elliot Brown. Elliot Brown looked great. He's the guy that got the bus. He's flexed up. He's jacked up. He looks fantastic. I hadn't heard of him before. But then when he started to do the athletic movements, the straight line stuff, like the vertical, 37 inch vertical, was nice. The rest of the workout was not the best. He's a little tight and a little, lot, a lot of tightness in the lower half. He's going to be playing an edge, uh, edge position probably maybe have his hand in the dirt. I would like to see him just be in a two-point stance off the edge, but he needs a little bit of work. He needs to add about 15 pounds, and he needs to get into a, a, a good stretching program and just get get loosened up. He's a super tight guy, massive, perfect frame. Lower body's nice, but he just needs a little bit of work. Darius Bratton, though, uh, a defensive back for Virginia, was working out with Anthony Johnson, uh, who's the better-known prospect probably at the entire Virginia Pro Day, and Darius Bratton was fantastic. Uh, 38 and a half inch vertical, 11 foot three broad jump at the pro day. Um, he was the the freak that took over 
and the testing. So again, off the bus, it's Elliot Brown testing. It's Darius Bratton workouts. Dontavian Wicks looked pretty good, pretty good. Uh, as far as the route running goes, as far as going through drills, he looked pretty good. Um, uh, vast improvements. Uh, a couple guys of note that I saw, you know, keeping a keen eye on the wide receiver specifically, uh, was, um, Phil Emery, the scout for the Atlanta Falcons, former GM for the bears. Uh, he was there watching 10, uh, you know, contently. And he, after the Dontavia Wicks workout got done with Keaton Thompson, put his notepad away, put it back in his backpack. He was set up. He didn't watch the rest of the workout, which was defensive line, the Ravens, and then the Patriots. The Patriots were focused mostly on Bratton, uh, talking to one of the scouts. That was kind of who he was there to watch. So that's kind of an interesting note for the New England Patriots. They're here. To, they're, they were looking at defensive backs, but they weren't looking at Johnson. They were looking at Bratton. So that's going to be a later round guy, uh, potentially sixth round, seventh round as a projection. So that was the. There wasn't a lot of takeaways from the Virginia Pro Day. Wicks looked better. I was hoping he was going to look better. Hopes, hoping the routes were going to look crisper. The quarterback they had thrown to him. Uh, I don't even remember his name. It was Reese something. He was not good. Um, they had some deep ball opportunities for Keaton Thompson and for Dontavia Wicks. All for naught. They were missed. The balls were overthrown, underthrown. Uh, There's also a ball by, uh, it was actually to Darius Bratton. They were doing cornerback drills and, and DB drills. And the quarterback threw the ball into the barricade. Uh, and Bratton went after it, ran into the barricade. Could have been scary. Could have been an injury. But Virginia Pro Day was good. Dontavian Wicks, uh, again, stays growing in the process, growing throughout the process. I don't know how to word that. He goes up through the process. As uh, the first couple of days at the Senior Bowl, he was not the best on the field by far. Um, but Wicks right now currently right behind Tyler Scott for me, wide receiver 15. Definitely a guy you're going to own a little bit of. I had a Michael Gallup. He had a good 1,400-yard season two years ago. Not as much this year. Wicks. I was talking to Alex Dunlap about it. It reminded me a lot of one player from last year. And I'll go out on this. He reminded me a lot of one particular player. And I'll give you the chat eight seconds if you can tell me who it was. Six foot three, 205 pounds, overdrafted, unathletic. Wicks is a little more athletic than him. He's got a better frame, better route runner. Dontavian Wicks reminded me of Romeo Dogwater Dobbs.